Good morning and welcome to BC 103 New Testament Survey. So today we're going to look at 2 Corinthians. Um, even before we could begin with our session, can I request one of you all to please lead us in prayer? You all can unmute. Yeah, okay, unmute and pray. Uh, Thank you for gathering us all here for this uh, time of uh, understanding your word, Heavenly Father. Help us to understand, have a good understanding of your word, Heavenly Father. Bless time I'm Heavenly Father. Help uh, minister through Heavenly Father this new teaching, new understanding of your word, Heavenly Father. And thank you very much for bringing us all here, Heavenly Father, to learn something new, Heavenly Father. Bless all those who are present here, Heavenly Father. And lead us mightily to this class, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Let me present the PowerPoint. Okay, so all of us can see the PowerPoint presentation. So this, uh, yesterday we looked into the first Corinthians. Today we're going to look into the second Corinthians, which is, and we all know that Paul's second letter to Corinthians, even though it is called as the second Corinthians in our Bible, there are multiple clues within the letter that it is not the second letter, but then Paul wrote four letters of which the first and the third letters are missing. So Paul started the church at Corinth in his second missionary journey. We get to know that when we study the book of Acts 18. We also see that uh, the main purpose of his writing, okay, the main purpose of him writing the second letter was the report that he got the first time was very disturbing report. That was the uh, leading for him to write the first Corinthians. Now, the second Corinthians was, again, he gets another report. And this time, the report is to do joyful, joyful. And so we can see that the five-fold purpose of him writing the second Corinthians, which are the first one. The first one, to assure the saints that the author, that is Apostle Paul, had the believers of the Corinthian church in his heart. So that, you know, in all his dealing with them, it was for their good. Yes, in 1 Corinthians, we saw that sometimes he was very stern, he was a little hard on them. But then there was a reason behind that. He wanted to see their life been changed. He wanted to see the Corinthian church believers have a transformed life. So that was one of the reasons why he was stern. And in the second letter, we see that he's been joyful because he's seen certain believers in the church being transformed and turning to be good. So the second purpose of him writing this letter was that he rejoiced. He's showing that I rejoice in your transformation. Because the people in the second Corinthian, uh, the believers in the uh, Corinthian church have now accepted the gospel and they see the lives were transforming and changing. The third reason of him writing the letter is to ask for arms. There was a famine in Jerusalem, which we will look into the later part of it. And uh, for the Jerusalem church is asking arms with all the believers, with all the churches of which he started. So this was one of the reasons in 2 Corinthians letter is asking for arms with the Corinthian church. The fourth reason is to affirm that he will visit them again. Then fifth one, he's addressing on a new threat that has been risen in the church by the Judaizers or the false teachers in the church, where 
in this letter, that is the last portion of the letter, we see that he is trying to defend his apostleship over the authority that he carries within himself, saying that the false teachers are trying to establish themselves by criticizing Apostle Paul. So he's trying to take up the apostleship, the authority as an apostle, what he has, and he's writing this letter to defend the gospel and his authority as well. So with that, and also we see uh, the reason was there was a, a Paul's experience against this false teachers and, you know, um, okay, he was, uh, he was very serious about defending these false teachers because um, he has birthed the church, he has birthed the church in Corinthians with a lot of hardship, with a lot of hardship and he cannot give it up like that to these false teachers who are deceiving, who are sharing a deceiving gospel. So here we see Apostle Paul coming against these false teachers and trying to, uh, trying to uh, uh, withstand his authority, saying that he was appointed by God and uh, his apostleship that God had given it to him. And uh, Paul also accused uh, these uh, false teachers by saying that they were the uh, uh, they were the uh, they were against the gospel they were against the gospel so um, we will move uh, we will move ahead and see what apostle paul is trying to explain so some of the defense what these false uh, teachers were coming against apostle paul was the first one we see is paul uh, that Paul changed his plan. In the first uh, letter, he said that I will come and visit you. And due to certain reason that he, which he explains in uh, chapter chapter one and chapter two, he explains why was he unable to come and visit the church because they were not ready enough to receive Apostle Paul. That he may sorrow over them if he comes. So they, he took time so that the church, the believers in the church would, you know, uh, would grow more in Jesus. So that was one of the reasons that he could not visit them. But the false teachers took that as an advantage and they came against him saying that you did not keep your word. You said that you will visit the church, but you didn't visit the church. The second was Paul felt the need to vindicate his apostleship against the false teachers, that he needs to justify that he is not wrong. Okay, And the third was um, suffering in the ministry as a primary proof of his motives in ministry. The last chapter where he finally defends that, you know, the weakness and the humility in the Lord. He talks about the servant leadership. He, talk, he ministers to people saying that it is not, uh, um, it is not the, uh, the ministry is not about eloquence, but then it is about the servant leadership. The main theme in this letter is Paul reaffirms some of the previous admonitions which he wrote in the first letter. Paul also defends his apostleship and answers charges against him that has come against him through the false teachers. So he answers them. And the third point here we see is Paul presents a message of reconciliation. Can I request one of you all to please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. Now all things are of God. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, not including their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of, for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Amen. Thank you. So we see three things in this verse. 
reconciliation of the world back to God. Reconciliation of the world back to God. And then we see the second reconciliation of the church back to himself. And the third point we see is there's a reconciliation of the repentant man to the church family. There are three reconciliation that has been considered. The, and we also see one of the main themes here is in this letter that Paul contra contrasts about the weakness of a man as opposed to the power of God. When a man is weak, he's saying that's where God's strength can be revealed. And the next point we also see that in his own life, Apostle Paul is setting that as a pattern for ministry. In other letters, we see that Apostle Paul is saying that, imitate me as I imitate Christ, because he's setting himself as an example. He's setting a pattern for the ministry. So every believer, every minister of God should have a pattern in the ministry. Should have, uh, He's setting an example. He's setting a pattern for the other ministers to follow him as an example, to follow the pattern in the ministry. So we see that in this letter, the last part of the letter, uh, chapter 10 to 13, we see that Apostle Paul is, uh, is laying down a principle of servant leadership. Uh, uh, servant leadership and he's setting himself as a role model in the ministry where he is encouraging all the other ministers to follow the lifestyle that he carried so let me see Sorry. yeah so every minister he's setting an example in this every minister should should be like this in the ministry. So what he says, he goes ahead and he, he lists certain points that we find in this letter. I thought I'll list all those points. So as a minister, we need to be, we need to flow in this ministry that is comfort and deliverance, forgiveness. We need to, we need to be filled in the spirit. We need to have a life of faith. We also see the reconciliation is very important. And we need to be approved by God when we serve him. How? Whenever we minister in word, the spirit of the Lord will demonstrate by the spirit of God. And then we see the restoration. We also see the message in this letter about giving, about the generosity fund. And then the meekness, get being bold that is in our weakness god's power will be strengthened the tenth is suffering yes in the ministry as a minister we need to endure certain suffering that comes our way we also see about humility humility should be in our nature and lastly we see discipline every minister of god should have certain discipline that needs to be uphold upheld in our life with that we also see some of the unique features of this book that paul opens his life in a uh, in a more personal way in this letter where apart from the letter to philemon in this letter uh, he, he shows himself very personal we see that he shares some of the interesting uh, details of his life where uh, he shares about the several experience of his life like um, how he escaped from the Damascus when the when they were about to kill him, uh, kill Apostle Paul, and they were, when they were searching for him, he escaped from Damascus through a basket. You know, he shares that instance here in chapter eleven, and then in chapter twelve, he also shares uh, an instant where, in his prayer time, he was caught up in the spirit in the third heaven. His personal experience during his prayer time, he shares. He also shares some of the personal struggles that he had. Uh, in chapter 12, he says that there is a thorn in his flesh. And in uh, chapter 1 or chapter 6 and 
and also in chapter 11 he says uh, he shares some of the personal sufferings that he's enduring in the ministry so ministry is not about it's going to be easy like the bed of roses but no in ministry there are suffering and as a minister of god how we can endure it so apostle paul considered to be the great apostle a great minister of god who wrote one third of the new testament the life in the ministry was not very pleasant for apostle paul he had to endure suffering he had to go through certain sufferings in the ministry he had to face the persecution within the church itself against him the church that he birthed himself came against him that's what we will see in this letter a little further he also shares uh, some of the related to gifting and stature uh, in in chapter 11 we see that he does not come with eloquent in speech and in chapter 10 he says he's inferior in stature which the false teachers took that as an advantage we also can we turn to first corinthians chapter 2 in first corinthians chapter 2 here it describes even in this letter he describes about his own personal weakness he says in uh, chapter 2 verse 3 and 4 he says i was with you in weakness in fear and in trembling so he had this most common nature that you and i have many times when you have to handle people ministry or uh, head a community head a congregation we do come across this we do come across the weakness we do fear we do um uh, tremble and in verse 4 he says my speech though he is a learned man he is a pharisee of pharisees but then what he says i did not come uh, i did not my speech and my preaching were not with pervasive words in other words he says i do not have eloquent in speech i may be i may not have the persuasive words of human wisdom but what i come with you front of you or before you is in demonstration of the spirit and of power you see the genuineness in his ministry he is just trying to be himself he is not trying to put uh, put a mask front of people trying to be some eloquent or trying to portray himself as rich but then he is coming as humble as he can just as a normal human being and he's very clearly saying, I just come with the simple words with what I could communicate. But the thing that I come is, there is a power of God that backs me up. The spirit of the Lord demonstrates, he backs me with what I say. There's a genuineness in his ministry. Well, Yeah, being said that, um, we will go much in detail about how he shares about his personal lifestyle, okay? Little later, I thought I'll just cover the a uh, few of the instances in this gospel in this letter so paul goes further and gives us one of the greatest new testament passage on giving or on being generosity and then he also shares some of the uh, some of the uh, challenges that he faced he's saying it is not only through human but he also had spiritual warfare in second corinthians 2 11 can i request you all to read second corinthians 2 11. so yeah he's saying it is just not human it is a warfare the Satan should not take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So here we see that uh, in this gospel, he portrays that Satan is a god of this world, is the serpent, is the angel of light. He also goes further and says that he is the adversary who tries to keep them from doing what is right. 
And he also says in chapter 11, 3, he says, Satan is the one who seeks to corrupt the mind of people. Because that's where, when we see further, how the believers in the church come against Apostle Paul. So he says it's not they who's trying to come, but then the Satan who's seeking to corrupt their mind and making them to come against him. And in chapter 4, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4, can I request one of you all to read? Should shine on them. Yeah, so we see that Satan blinds the heart of people, those who do not know God. And further in chapter 10, verse 3 to 6, when we read, verse 3 to 6, can I request you all to read? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. So we see that for though we walk in flesh, we do not war according to flesh. So in this verse, we see that there is a spiritual warfare. There is a spiritual warfare where it is necessary for us to defeat this enemy. Okay, we said that the whole, we uh, in 2 Corinthians, we have about uh, 13 chapters. Okay, uh, let me change the slide. Okay, so we have about 13 chapters and these 13 chapters is divided into three portions. Okay, we can look into our slide. The first chapter, from chapter 1 to chapter 7, we see Paul's reconciliation with the Corinthians. And chapter 8 to 9, we see he's talking about the forgotten generosity. Why he had to talk about the forgotten generosity? We will look into it a little Okay, in detail. And then chapter 10 to 13, Paul, Paul's defense on his apostleship. It is so important that people should know, the believers in the church should know that you are the chosen one. You are the leader. And he is defending his authority and apostleship that is given to him by God. So what we see here is, let's go into the letter we can turn to chapter 1. Yeah. So what we see here is Paul gets a report that the things were uh, getting better from before. Because in the first letter, we saw that things were not going well. And there were a lot of problems. And that, uh, uh, that made Apostle Paul very sad. But here we see that certain believers were getting transformed, getting changed, but still there is certain problem in the church. So he wrote the first letter to correct those problems. And in the second letter, Paul is teaching that um, those who are rebelling against the authority, that is against the leadership. So he's trying to write in this letter and tell them and to assure that God has appointed him. So Paul wrote this letter to assure that he was stern and little hard on these believers was because he loved them. He wanted the believers to change and have a transformed life where they, where they will be more in Christ likeness. So that's why he, he writing the second letter saying that I love you. And that was one of the reasons why I wrote a stern letter to you all in the first time. So in this letter, uh, we see the three uh, sections. And Paul opens up the letter by saying, I thank God. God of all mercy and comfort, who brought peace and encouragement to me by hearing a good report this time. And this has encouraged him. 
and he also wants uh, to open an honest relationship with these people and he says um, i have discovered later that there is a transformation there is a change in you and paul responds to his letter uh, uh, paul talks about the new covenant later part we see that he is talking about the new covenant and he is saying this new covenant when we compare to the old covenant it is much better covenant why because we see that it is more glorious because of the resurrected jesus who is the glory of god and he lives for ever and he also says that in his spirit there is when we believe there is transforming of life when we believe in jesus there is transforming of life so we see again and again apostle paul is trying to take an opportunity to share the gospel about jesus death burial resurrection and ascension and he says when we believe in jesus our lives can be transformed and he also says the new covenant is better than the old covenant because it is more glorious and we become we will grow more to be christ like and the second part in uh, chapter 9 8 to 9 it talks about the generosity talks about the forgotten generosity why because the jewish the jewish christians in jerusalem they have fallen into poverty right now due to the famine in that place and apostle paul is trying to raise a generosity fund among the churches that he planted so most of the churches are coming forward to give except for the corinthian church so the corinthian church certain leaders in the church or certain people the believers in the corinthian church were against apostle paul so because of that they didn't collect the generosity fund now we need to understand why were they against so we will come to it later because of the false teachers in the church but what happened here because they didn't collect the generosity fund apostle paul goes in detail and he preaches the message of generosity again he takes the opportunity to share the gospel to them because for every issue for every problem gospel is the only message because the gospel has the power to change any human inside out so if somebody is not collected the generosity fund to help another believer who is in christ that means there is some problem within you that is that area needs to be transformed needs to be corrected so how can you bring a correction only by sharing the gospel so apostle paul shares the gospel with them again he says he says you know the generous grace of our lord jesus who was the messiah that even though he was rich for our sake he became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich he goes further and he tells the story of the gospel through the financial like financial metaphor so that they can understand he says jesus gave up his glorious honor or wealth glorious honor or wealth and he lowered himself to die like a poor slave if god has chosen jesus could have been born in a palace isn't it but where was jesus born in a humble place and he died as a poor slave so that other people who are in poverty through sin and death can be exalted and become wealthy through the riches of god's glory so here he says for us to be a christian is to let the story sink deep in our mind and in our heart and let this nature of christ transform our inner being so that we may flow in generosity and your apostle paul is also making it very clear please don't give the generosity fund because i am asking okay our leader is asking let's go to it no it should come out of willingness 
because the scripture says it is more blessed to give than to receive this is one of the teaching of jesus himself it is more blessed to give than to receive and it is more blessed to give from what you have and uh, to share your life and resources to help others and here he says in chapter 8 and 9 i've put up on the slide certain points which he talks about generosity in these two chapters he says give liberally out of your own poverty you can't say i'm poor i have one bread no god says give out from what you have in fact jesus in the gospels we see that jesus appreciated the women who gave the offering of all that she had the one coin that she had she put in so jesus appreciates it say you are more blessed because you gave all that you have you have given whereas others are giving little from what they have but then you are giving with all that you have so we need to give from our own poverty we also see giving willingly beyond our ability so this should be part of our nature this is what christ likeness a transformed life can be where we be willingly we give willingly beyond our ability and in uh, chapter 8 verse 5 it also says giving ourselves to god first giving ourselves to god first it's so it's not only about finance giving out money giving out material things no god is also looking how you give yourself to god first in every area god likes the first fruit giving your time early in the morning giving your time or giving your time out of 24 hours setting at least 2 hours for god in prayer how are you in giving yourself to god first and then we see giving in such a way as to abound in the grace of giving so again we see giving is not something simple it's not that we give it is the grace that we receive from god that makes us give and uh, chapter 8 verse 9 we see that making yourself poor so that others can be made rich this is very difficult isn't it but this is the nature of christ where you give yourself out you don't withhold anything for yourself but then you bless others so that others can also be a blessing point 6 we see sowing generously leads to bountiful reaping because it is contagious generosity is contagious giving should be done purposefully not haphazardly giving should be done cheerfully and not grudgingly only when we give cheerfully there is a blessing there is a reward from what we give and ninth we see giving in faith leads to multiplication giving in faith leads to multiplication tenth spiritual blessing comes upon giver everything that you give as so the scripture says even if you give a glass of water to a prophet you will have the reward of a prophet everything that you give your time your money water material things everything as a reward and as a blessing and with that we will move on to the final section chapter 10 to 13 chapter 10 to 13 paul focuses mainly on the conflict with the corinthians where there was a certain group of impressive leaders so called judaizers who came against apostle paul uh, you know and he calls them apostle paul calls them super apostles so they came to corinthian church 
when Apostle Paul was in there, he planted the church and he has gone to different places. He's at Ephesus and other places. Now, in his absence, there are other people like Judaizer leaders who come to this Corinthian church and they are ministering and they are ministering and they're trying to promote themselves by ill speaking of against Paul, Apostle Paul. They, they, um, you know, they po point out Apostle Paul to be a very poor and unsuccessful leader. They also, uh, uh, you know, say that they actually say that, uh, you know, he is not eloquent in speech. But then we, knowing Apostle Paul, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he's a well-learned man. He knew the Bible. And also, these people who came against Paul, they bragged about their superior knowledge with God. Whereas Apostle Paul, you see that he has seen and experienced the risen Jesus in his life, where he writes about the visions that he has seen about Jesus. And he also writes about the uh, heavenly encounter. But more importantly, we see that Apostle Paul is given his entire life to the mission of Jesus, where he sacrificed himself. He sacrificed his comfort and stability, and he never asked the Corinthian church to give him or help him with money or to support him in his ministry. In fact, we see that Apostle Paul, he, he supported himself by a tent making business. He never asked anyone for money to help him. But then these super apostles uh, or the false teachers who are in the church, in fact, they are charging the people with a big amount. They are taking money from the people. And they are blaming Apostle Paul for that. But Paul is making the statement very clear that I take care of my own living. I do not come to you for any money for my personal thing. I only asked to help the Jerusalem church who are going through famine. We being one body in Christ, we need to be there to help each other during the time of difficulty. But then I didn't come front of you to ask money to support me or my ministry, whereas I supported myself with my tent making business. Apostle Paul also goes ahead and he refuses, um, you know, against these false teachers. And he says that I may be imperfect and weak in my stature. But then in all my inadequacies, I see God's love and God's grace being with me. In fact, he also says when he seeked God, when there was a thorn in his flesh. Now, this thorn in the flesh, we exactly, um, you know, some scholars have a debate on that. It may be some sickness that was there as a thorn in the flesh. Some scholars say that, you know, the uh, the false teachers were coming against his ministry or uh, not allowing him to flourish in the ministry. But then here he makes it very clear that God told him, when he see God against this thorn in the flesh, God told him that my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So don't worry about your weakness for only in your weakness that I can reveal my strength. Now, this can be the same message to every minister of God who are seated here or hearing online or much later in our e-learning. Don't worry about your weakness because the Lord says, as the Lord said to Apostle Paul, that he's saying, in your weakness, my strength will be revealed. It is an opportunity that in our weakness, we seek God. We seek more of him. We say, Lord, you be with me. Just like how Apostle Paul said, I may not be eloquent in my speech. I may, I may not be as strong in my stature. But Lord, here I am. Here I am. I may be imperfect in my stature. And, uh, you know, um, and your Apostle Paul is saying, God is saying to Apostle Paul that my grace is sufficient for you. And uh, Paul also concludes the letter with a very sober warning to the Corinthians. He says that they need to check themselves. 
certain believers who were against Apostle Paul. He's saying, check yourself because the hatred for Paul, his way of life was the love for the super apostle. If they hated Apostle Paul, because the scripture also says, um, one man cannot serve two masters. So if they hated Paul, they hated Paul because they went toward the teaching of the false teachers. So the false teachers were trying to put down Apostle Paul and put themselves up. And here he is, he, uh, Apostle Paul is writing to those believers. He's saying that you may hate me, but then you hate me because you love the false teachers and they teaching. It all shows that you have not taken or received the fundamental message of Jesus, which was taught to you. So basically, you were not living like the transformed believers of Jesus. So he invites them. He's not forsaking them. He invites them once again and saying, I humbly request you all to come back to the love of Jesus. And in the letter of 2 Corinthians, we see that it gives a very uh, unique side. It gives a very unique side of Apostle Paul and the par paradox set before by the cross of Jesus. So we see that the cross challenges our values. One way of seeing the world, and we value success, education, wealth, but then front of God, what is the greatest value? The greatest value before God is humility, weakness, because his love and power were made known through the suffering of Jesus, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus by the work that Jesus did on the cross. So what we see in this letter is that the cross, the cross that unleashes the transforming power and the presence of the Holy Spirit which empowers each of us in our weaknesses, because that's how Apostle Paul came to the believers. Apostle Paul preached with all his weakness in front of them, because that's where he says that, you know, God reveals his strength to me, through me. And that's what uh, the Second Corinthians is all about, uh, where we see Jesus is the one who comforts us in our suffering, reconciles us back to God and gives us strength in our weakness. The whole message of this letter is that. The ministry is not, uh, you know, very easy or uh, a place of comfort zone, but a person like Apostle Paul, if he has endured so much of suffering, so much of opposition from the people, how much more you and I would face in this generation or in our time. But then the comfort is this, that Jesus is with us. When we suffer, we take part in the suffering of Jesus. And when we look up to him, we are being reconciled because we need to get a heart set. Only the love of God, through the love of God, we can minister to people who come against us. And through all our weaknesses where we can, when we look up to Jesus, when we look up to him, we will be strengthened. And that's what the whole message of 2 Corinthians is. We see God's strength in our weakness. So let's not give up, give up what God has called each of us to do just because we are weak. If you see, when you look back at the early church, most of the disciples and the apostles, in fact, were weak. They were ineloquent. But then it was the Lord's strength that backed them up. It was the Lord who enabled them to speak. That's the promise that God is giving to each of us today, that I will back you. No matter what your weakness is, today when you surrender that weakness to God, and Jesus is saying that I will strengthen you. I can transform your weakness to be your strength. 
So every weakness. Um, today, as we study the letter of Second Corinthians, let's take this time as an opportunity to surrender our weakness to God. And let's seek God, saying, God, here I come before you, surrendering my weakness to you. And I pray that you will strengthen my weakness. You will change this weakness to be a strength to serve you in your kingdom. So can I request, as we have three minutes, can I request one or two to, you know, unmute and raise your voice and pray? As you are led by the Lord, just unmute and pray. Nina, Rin, Sri Radha, anyone, anyone can pray or Sean. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, thank you very, thank much, you very much for leading us mighty in this time of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you very, thank you very much, much for having us understand the Queen Corinthians, Heavenly Father. And thank and you very, thank you very much, much for helping us change your understanding to dynamic, Heavenly Father. Thank you for leading us and leading our mighty in our experience to us, Heavenly Father, about this whole book, Heavenly Father. Please help us to understand more about this book, Heavenly Father, and help us to continue to learn more things about the Bible, Heavenly Father, know things about the New Testament, Heavenly Father. And, uh, and uh, thank you once again for uh, bringing us all here together today in order to gain this new understanding. In Jesus', in Jesus name, name we pray. Amen. Amen. One more person. Father God, we surrender this time into your hands, Lord. Father, I have learned of what you can go. Father God, can you tell me? Can you all check the volume? Yes, Jackin, we can yes. Father God, Father, as we surrender, Lord, at this time at your feet, Father God, Father, we want to surrender each of us into your hands to the truth of your word, Lord. You have spoken to each of us, Lord. Father, it is not our weakness, Lord, but you see us as your strength, Lord. You love us, Lord, and you have given us your strength, and your grace is sufficient for us, Lord, more than enough, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to trust in your grace, in your strength, in your word, Lord, to proceed in the way that you want us to go, because you are showing us the path, Lord, and we we do not know we did not need to fear anything even our own weakness lord cannot prevent your purposes in our lives to be fulfilled master god you have chosen each of us lord to live for you and to glorify your name it is all about you jesus father as we surrender this time lord each of us in our own way where we are struggling lord at that very point help us to yield ourselves completely to you father god it might be different for different people lord lord but father as we give this time into your hands father i surrender myself lord father the calling that you have called me to be the purposes that you have called me to live father help me lord in jesus precious name amen amen, amen. thank you sean thank you jackin um Thank you so much for joining in today's session. So let's meet next week with the next book, next letter to Galatians. Thank you. God bless. Okay. Um, yeah.